spring. <laughs> so I want to welcome uh, those here in the room and those who are joining us online on our live stream to this Saturday Morning Physics. Uh, I want to note that Saturday Morning Physics is made possible by you and by your many generous contributions uh, and those of many other Saturday Morning Physics fans. So thank you so much for supporting Saturday Morning Physics. To learn more, go to SaturdayMorningPhysics.org. Uh, Saturday Morning Physics is also grateful to have the support of the Dr. Mary Lois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Van Lu Family Endowment, and the Pulakeshi Dayalu Astrophysics Fund. And uh, I want to say that uh, last week we had the Giving Blue Day or Giving, Giving Tuesday, and uh, it went very well, so we're very grateful for your contributions uh, there. Before moving on, I will write on the board with chalk or somebody else. Well, if you guys can give me a hand, um, that we will have the traditional question and answer session uh, later. And if you'd like to submit questions, those online or even those here in the lecture hall, please go to physics at umich.edu. I've never had to do this in real time before. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm honored, I'm really honored today uh, to introduce uh, today's speaker, Dr. Laura Grego, who's a senior scientist at the Union of Concerned Scientists, where she is research director of the Global Security Program. Dr. Grego, Laura, is an expert in nuclear security and space policy, and she's from Michigan, Gross Point, in fact, and she's a Wolverine. She graduated in 1992 with degrees in physics and astronomy, which was not common for women at the time, and it's really still not, in fact. Laura then moved on to graduate study in physics at Caltech, also uncommon, uh, building instrumentation for early studies of the cosmic microwave background radiation scattered through galaxy clusters and the science that could be learned from her data. After a postdoc at the Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge, Massachusetts, for four years uh, working on X-ray astronomy, um, she joined the Union of Concerned Scientists where she has been ever since. Laura is widely recognized for her scholarship analyzing critical issues in security and arms control, and for her efforts to educate through numerous academic and media channels, a broad arc from students to the public to policymakers. As a fellow of the APS Forum on Physics and Society, and she has been recognized with the Leo Zillard Award um, among the highest praise uh, that our community gives for her accomplishments. In this vein and theme, Laura has come back to Ann Arbor uh, to give a presentation to graduate students on her path in the Life After Graduate School series yesterday. And today she will educate us with her lecture entitled, The Future Oppenheimer Feared, What We Can Do to Reduce the Nuclear Threat. Laura, welcome back and thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thanks to the department for hosting me and inviting me. Thanks to all of you for spending your Saturday mornings talking, being here and listening in. I really appreciate it. And thanks to Michigan. I, I can't help but talk about Michigan before I go on. Uh, I was, as Tim mentioned, I was an undergraduate here. In my first physics class was in this room. I used to sit up there. Um, and. Uh, I have three sisters, one of us here who graduated from Michigan, a niece who just graduated two years ago, uh, two of my uh, st senior uh, staff scientists in my program, Dr. Chinese Forte graduated from, with her PhD from Michigan a few years ago, and one of my other scientists, uh, Silgi Park, was an undergraduate here in the Jew sciences before getting her PhD at uh, Stanford. So I have Michigan in my roots, in my blood, and I continue to love this place, so I'm really happy to be back. Um, uh, Tim, so uh, I, today I'm going to talk about um, the future Oppenheimer feared, and uh, can I, I'm not everybody I'm sure has seen the Oppenheimer film, but probably many of you have, so 
hands if you have. Okay, I do recommend it. It's a, it's a great movie, and you'll learn a lot. Uh, and I'm going to talk. I'll go through some of the history, but but sort of with a uh, more physics bent, and uh, talk about uh, where we are today. So I'll skip ahead to today, uh, what the world looks like having been shaped by nuclear weapons for all of these intervening decades, what the dangers and risks they pose today, and of course at the end I'd like to talk a bit about what we can all do about it. So um, briefly, because uh, Tim mentioned, uh, you might be unfamiliar with my organization, it's called the Union of Concerned Scientists. It was founded in 1969 by students and faculty from MIT. And at the time, they were seeing a lot of research funding going into weapons systems, and they wanted to see science used to solve society's problems instead. Uh, and more than 50 years later, we're an organization. It isn't a union, uh, but it's an organization with uh, around 250 staff. About a third of those are scientists and analysts. Um, and we try to put rigorous science to work to build a healthier planet and a safer world. Um, uh, so we do technical analysis married with advocacy and uh, communications and outreach to the public and to policymakers. Um, if you're interested in this work, I'll, at the end I'll show you how to join or <laughs> join us as a member. We have half a million members, uh, and uh, I can tell you more about those types of things. But um, it's a wonderful organization. Okay, um, so to orient us where we are today. Who has nuclear weapons? Um, at present, there are nine countries in the world that have nuclear weapons. And it could have been a lot more. It's, it's a, in a, a wonderful success that there aren't hundreds. Um, so uh, while I'll tell you a lot of things about how the world is dangerous, this I, I, I definitely want to say um, that, that we, we could be in a much worse place. Um, that includes Russia, the United States, China, France, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, Israel, and North Korea. Um, but it is important to note that the arsenals of Russia and the United States account for about 90% of these weapons. Um, as for total numbers, according to the latest estimates, there are around 12,700 nuclear warheads in the world today, of which about 9,400 are in active military stockpiles. So given that a single nuclear weapon can destroy a major city and could kill millions of people, um, and dozens of such weapons could end a functioning society, uh, it's important um, that we sh make sure we don't uh, settle into complacency. Um, so, how many of us here know what this is? <laughs> Duck and cover. Duck and cover. Yeah. So, probably people who are older, about older than me. I'm Gen X, so my sort of popular culture references are really centered around the nuclear threat. The, the films, the music, all, all of those things. Um, but people who are a little older than me had duck and cover drills, civil defense in case of nuclear attack. And these, kids, these kids were um, trying to protect themselves. I'm, it's, it's, it is sort of funny, but in a terrible way. Um, so we, we, you had duck and cover drills like the way in Michigan we have tornado drills today. Um, this is what kids were supposed to do. Uh, so I am, I am a little concerned that um, people who are in generations younger than me, while they, I think, have really keen sense of the dangers that climate change and its effects will have on our society and really worried about it, I think because not growing up uh, it, under the same type of experience as we had during the Cold War may not fully understand uh, the implications of being handed this big, dangerous contraption of uh, massive nuclear arsenals. So one of the things I do, I really do try to speak to students and early career scientists and uh, community groups about really where we are today to make sure that they understand this is as existential a threat as um, climate change is. Um, so um, I'm going to sort of return to the story where we're starting. Um, uh, with the nuclear weapons story, and, is, uh, and as in almost every topic of science, you could start, you, you could start sort of any place, it's a continuum, the, the accumulation of knowledge and intellectual effort, but I'm going to start with a, a story here, because it's a great story, and uh, this, this is a picture of Leo Szilard, who, um, as Tim mentioned, I had a lectureship for a year, I was meant to give these types of talks, uh, sort of inspired by Leo Szilard, and he was a very interesting person. But where we are, so, so he's a little older in this picture than the story I'm going to tell. But um, So I'm going to start on a street corner on a rainy day in September 1933. 
So Leo Szilard was a Hungarian Jew who had fled first to Berlin um, and then to London. And he was furiously raising money to bring other scientists, refugee scientists, out of uh, Nazi Germany because he saw what was going to happen. He literally got on the last train out um, from Berlin before uh, they closed the borders. Um, uh, and that's going to be important later in the story because a lot of those refugee scientists were very important to the Manhattan Project. Um, another important thing about Szilard was that he was really good friends with Einstein during his days as a student in Berlin. In fact, they, they really liked each other. This will become important later in the story. And they even uh, came up with a patent for an um, apparently ingenious but totally unusable kind of refrigerator. So they, they were good friends. Um, anyway, so back in London, Leo was walking and thinking, uh, mostly about a comment that he had read in the newspapers from Lord Rutherford, the eminent English physicist, um, about the newly demonstrated technique of artificially inducing a transmutation of one element to another by bombarding it with a proton. And these reactions released a lot of energy um, you know, in perspective with an atom compared to the, the energy that the proton supplied. So it was sort of a source of energy. And, but Lord Rutherford stated that he thought that given the energy needed to create these reactions, um, that anyone who looked for a source of power in the transformation of atoms was talking moonshine. Um, and Leo liked nothing more than finding a way to poke at people who made broad statements or who were in positions of authority. So. Uh, he liked finding ways around things that were seemingly impossible. And in fact, later in his life, he treated himself, he treated his own bladder cancer with a radiation device he invented and cured himself. So that was the kind of guy. He was always thinking about um, ideas and implications. So between stepping off one corner of one side of the street and getting to the other side, Szilard had a brilliant idea, namely the chain reaction, the nuclear chain reaction. So the neutron had just been discovered by James Chadwick the year before, uh, observed as a product of a nuclear reaction. So what if a nuclear reaction produced not just energy, but more neutrons than were used to generate that reaction? So maybe like one in and two out. It was conceivable. So if you needed one neutron incoming to produce energy, but the reaction released two, then those two atoms could generate energy and um, create reactions in the next two, and you tell two friends, and you tell two friends, and uh, it becomes self-sustaining without having to continually input uh, the energy of the first particle. So uh, Szilard was the kind of person who thought, he ran his thought experiments to their final implications, and he was also keenly interested in politics, having really needed those skills in order to uh, survive in um, what was to become Nazi Germany. Um, so he, he thought one aspect of such a thing would be producing energy for positive human development and use, but the other implication was that a very fast and large sustained chain reaction would be an enormously powerful weapon. So he signed the patent, he was very into patents, um, and he was really good friends with Einstein who was great at patents, so he picked up that skill. Um, he assigned it to the British Admiralty because that was the only way he could think about keeping this idea secret. Um, and uh, he set about trying different types of materials to see if he could start a chain reaction. Um, the, the nuclear science was very immature at that point, and people didn't know a ton about these things, and so he didn't have a lot of luck. Um, and nuclear physics was, fission had not been observed or even really suspected at that time. Uh, so Szilard moved to New York, um, tried to cobble experiments together, he gave up believing there was, a, there was a material that would actually be suitable. At the time, Enrico Fermi in Italy was exploring the materials and reactions that would be important, but no one was putting the whole picture together. That all changed in uh, December 1938 when nuclear fission, the splitting of an atom into pieces, was observed experimentally by Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, who turned to Lise Meitner and Otto Frisch to explain it theoretically. They predicted that the fission of the element uranium, the, heavy, the heaviest in the periodic table at that point, would produce additional neutrons. So Szilard, realizing his idea of nuclear waste, so in fact, he had just cabled, he was sick in the hospital with a fever, had just cabled the Admiralty, I give up, you can release this patent. The same day, he got this news, uh, and apparently, this is the story, got himself out of the hospital, went to the Western Union and telegraphed, forget I said that because he realized that uh, his idea of a nuclear weapon powered by a fission chain reaction was a real possibility, and that any competent physicist, including the excellent German physicists he knew very well, would also realize the implications of nuclear fission. So he set about getting 
set, a, set to work getting the attention of the U.S. government. So he went out to Long Island where his friend Einstein had eventually, he was summering, Einstein had uh, moved to the Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, and he convinced uh, Einstein to write a, a letter to President Roosevelt because he knew Einstein could, could speak to presidents. So he sort of invented this political strategy of getting your important, powerful friends to, uh, to, um, speak to speak to the powers that be. And he wanted, uh, uh, he wanted Einstein to persuade Roosevelt to start a research program that would look into these uh, fissi fissionable materials in nuclear fission. Um, Einstein was a noted pacifist, and he has said that his only involvement in the Manhattan Project was as Szilard's mailbox, because uh, he did this several more times as the years went on. Uh, so here's the physics. Uh, um, as most of you all know, um, eventually Szilard and Einstein uh, and other scientists persuaded the, the Roosevelt um, uh, government to start this top secret Manhattan Project beginning in 1941. And it was an enormous effort. Uh, it changed, it, it, it charged many of the best physicists and engineers in the, comp in the country and assembled them uh, to take this theoretical science and uh, build it into a working weapon. So I think that the film Oppenheimer dramatizes this process um, really effectively. Um, so scientists got to work and rapidly worked out the theory um, and performed the necessary experiments. In fact, um, so this book you can buy on, um, you can buy at many bookstores, and uh, it's usually about ten dollars. It's called the Los Alamos Primer. And the summer before the Manhattan Project, a bunch of these really smart physicists sat down and wrote everything they knew about the physics and how you might build an atomic bomb. And uh, so they they worked out most of it at the beginning. So a lot of the effort really was to 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 find and uh, refine the the actual materials. But this is how it works. Um, so. For each fission, um, you get about uh, 200 MeV, which is, a act, you know, in the face of it, a small amount of energy. But for a normal chemical reaction where you're stripping off electrons or changing sort of the electron structure, usually those reactions are a few EV. So it's an enormous, it's, you know, orders of magnitude more per atom than normal chemical reactions. And that is really, that is really what we're, the difference in nuclear weapons, the, the amount of power in a small amount of material. Um, so the basic physics was worked out. Uranium uh, very is a very heavy element. It has 92 protons, which signifies its uh, atomic number. And it has an atomic mass of 235, meaning it has 143 neutrons, so a lot of them. Um, if uranium-235 is bombarded by a neutron of the right energy, it will more often than not break into break apart into two larger pieces, for example, the elements barium and krypton, and it will, will release, on average, a few more than two neutrons, um, sometimes, sometimes less and sometimes more, but about two per uh, reaction. And so uh, you can calculate with sort of the, the normal density of uranium. Uh, it takes about 80 generations of fission to fission about a kilogram of material, and that'll take about a microsecond, which is a very fast reaction. Um, um, so the, um, of course, the science was worked out. They needed to do a lot of experimentation to figure out the cross sections, the mean free paths to, to, to work this out. But the basic physics had been worked out. Um, so you sort of calculate um, uh, how much you need. So a critical mass, critical mass means, um, so each of these reactions, if you have a, a nuclear fission and they release neutrons, you do need it to, uh, to you know, happen upon another uranium atom Soon, you, know, you can't let it just stream out to the countryside. It needs to bump into the next uh, uranium atom, you know, uh, before it, it leaves the, the surface. So, so you need enough material so it doesn't keep flying out. You need sort of a critical mass. Um, and so, you, using the um, the measured uh, cross sections and mean free paths, basically, they were able to work it out to roughly uh, knowing that they need 52 about 52 kilograms of uranium. Uh, and plutonium was quickly realized, uh, sort of a slightly heavier element, that that was also going to be a great candidate for uh, nuclear fission. And uh, in fact, uh, sort of a more effective material in that you didn't need quite as much. So you needed about 10 kilograms of plutonium. And there are ways to design your 
um, refine your design with neutron reflectors and shaping and doing different things to make that number smaller, um, which they worked out in intervening years. But so, but, so the reason I pick up this book is the basic, the, learning how to design the nuclear weapon wasn't the hard part. It was really being able to assemble the fissile materials, the uranium, enriched uranium, because only one isotope is really appropriate for this. Um, and to and the plutonium, which doesn't occur naturally or barely ever, so it needs to be made in a nuclear reactor. So that turns out to be enormously lucky because that is a technical bottleneck. That is one of the reasons there aren't hundreds of countries with nuclear weapons because it's very hard to uh, make and obtain these um, these materials. So, for example, um, the uh, the isotope of uranium you need for for a nuclear weapon is uranium-235. And natural uranium that comes out of the ground in your form of uranium ore is only 1 1 40th uranium-235, and the rest is uranium-238, which isn't useful. So you have to find a way to extract the good isotope from the isotope that basically reacts chemically, entirely identical chemically, and just barely heavier or, bar I'm sorry, barely lighter than the other isotopes. So there are lots of different ways um, that this industrial process to pr create this was enormous. In fact, figuring out how to enrich uranium and extract plutonium, they basically built something as big as the automobile industry at the time. That was the industrial effort needed to, to make these products. So in the Oppenheimer film, it really focuses on Los Alamos itself, but at the time, the real efforts were being made um, for example, at Oak Ridge in Tennessee and in Hanford, uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where they're making the enriched uranium, and um, Hanford, um, uh, Washington State, where they were making the plutonium. In fact, um, some people say that the people who lived there were some of the first victims of the nuclear age because um, they were, you know, that was a very dirty process. Uh, Hanford, Washington is, I think, the largest Superfund site we have in the country today uh, because of, um, of the work that was done there, and um, people have been, lives have been affected for decades because of this. Um, so for your enriching uranium, there were a bunch of different uh, engineering techniques designed to enrich and, and pull out those uraniums. They tried sort of um, ionizing and using an uh, elect electrical, uh, electrostatic force um, Contemporary method is using gas centrifuges. So if you hear in the news talking about, does Iran have centrifuges? Where do they have them? What do they look like? That The whole process there is to be able to enrich uranium to be able to be used in nuclear weapons. Uh, it's, that's uh, uh, still a, a challenging um, engineering project. For plutonium, it, again, it doesn't occur naturally, so you have to make it in reactors. And that's a really slow process, you know, um, you get about a gram, eight, eight kilograms per year from a small reactor. And then you have to extract the plutonium from the fuel rods. It's a, it's a dirty chemical process. So that is the key to um, keeping nuclear weapons not, as, um, not spreading, or we call them non-proliferation in our field, meaning they don't go to additional places that you don't mean them to go to. So they worked out the basic uh, engineering, the basic concept of the nuclear weapon. So for... Um, for uh, the first nuclear weapon, uh, Little Boy, which was the one used in Hiroshima, it used uranium-235, and it was basically a very, very simple design. In fact, to assemble the critical mass, um, so once, once you have a critical mass, you will have a nuclear explosion or supercritical mass. And so the design of it was really like a gun. There were um, <clears throat> rings made of uranium here and an explosive, just a conventional type explosive, sent a bolt to the middle and when they assembled that became a critical mass. Um, in fact, they, that, the design was so simple they didn't test it before using it. Um, that type of design wouldn't work for plutonium because uh, with some physics reasons, uh, they needed to assemble the critical mass faster. And so what they did instead was to um, have a not quite critical mass in a plutonium ball, and then to crush it symmetrically and make it denser from a um, symmetrical crush. And so a lot of the effort you may have seen in um, Oppenheimer where they're blowing things up, blowing things up, they were trying to perfect the, uh, the ability to, within a microsecond, have all of these conventional explosive aligned in sort of a soccer ball pattern around a metal to quickly, uh, 
crush it to a higher density and create um, a critical mass. They weren't entirely sure of that design, which is the reason that they tested it before in the Trinity test. Um, so this is the gadget. They called it the gadget. This is um, the the test that they, the bomb they used in the in the Trinity test. Um, the scientists and engineers chose a site they described as suitably isolated, and they believed that the flat terrain out in um, the Tularosa Basin and the low winds would keep the, the, the fallout to a minimum. Um, while they described it as isolated, there were about a half a million people who lived within 150 miles of the Trinity site. <clears throat> Those people were not warned or told um, to evacuate, neither before or after the test. Um, th and those folks are absent from the Oppenheimer movie, so I do like to make sure they're part of the picture when we think about this. Um, and this sort of negligence did become a regular feature of post-war nuclear test program, which included more than 200 above-ground nuclear explosions. Um, data collected by the National Cancer Institute showed that the fallout from those tests, the 200 above-ground nuclear tests that happened in the 50s and 60s, um, has led to tens to hundreds of thousands of excess cancers. Um, pretty much everybody who's alive after that has some residual, uh, residual uh, material in their bodies from these tests. Um, some of these people have, um, have been able to get compensation from the government for this harm, um, although not the Trinity downwinders. But um, actually right this moment in Congress, Congress is on the brink of instituting more compensation for these folks. So. Um, this is the Trinity, I'm just going to show a short video um, of the Trinity test. If you haven't seen... Um, Five, four, three, two, one. In the dead silence of the morning, at 5.29.45 Mountain War Time, the Jornada del Muerto was bathed in an intense flash of a light that man had only seen from the stars. We knew the world would not be the same. cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. So once uh, uh, they had confidence that this was a working weapon, um, this was near the end of World War II. Germany had surrendered. Hitler had, was uh, no longer alive. Uh, but there was a decision to be made. Um, and um, many of the scientists of the Manhattan Project at that time urged the government to, instead of using it against the Japanese, to instead do a demonstration. Uh, Leo Szilard is, one of, of course, one of the ringleaders of that effort um, to persuade to, in, to not to not use it uh, as, as an instrument of war, uh, and were unsuccessful. Um, so uh, in, in uh, August 1945, a bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, and then a f three days later uh, on the city of Nagasaki, and uh, hundreds, tens of thousands of people immediately died for, uh, the estimates vary about the total uh, number of people who perished or who were injured, um, but likely more than 200,000 people. Um, and in the following weeks from radiation poisoning. Um, some of the scientists of the Manhattan Project thought, now people see what this, what this can do. That's the end of war. 
we've now we know so that what the, you know the the upside of this will mean we will have no appetite for ever using these again and nobody will dare have any war in order to not risk the, this happening um, in fact and they thought once we see this happening we should put this technology under international control um, but that isn't what happened <laughs> what Oppenheimer feared is what happened so uh, moving quickly beyond um, the fission weapon that we saw demonstrated in the video and the types that were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there was a new type of weapon, the H-bomb, the therm thermonuclear uh, weapon, the super, if you heard those words in the movie or if you've heard those words before, this is the modern type of nuclear weapon design which essentially uses that fission bomb as a trigger for the larger bomb. So these, are, these rely on the fusion of light, of light chemical elements um, using the high pressure created by the fission bomb to create nuclear fusion and give enormously more yields, sort of many times larger. Um, the first hydrogen bomb was 15 megatons, um, uh, and the largest Soviet design was called Tsar Bomba, that was uh, 100 megatons, compared to the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs, which were uh, uh, 20 and 15 kilotons. Um, in fact, they looked like this. The tests <laughs> were enormous. So those little dots around the perimeter of the circle, those are ships that were not, no one was on them, but they were instrumented to, to understand what happened in these tests. Um, so the U.S. had done its early tests in Nevada, um, but shifted its testing to the Pacific Islands, mostly the Marshall Islands. This was detonated over Bikini Atoll. So the Marshallese who lived there, that was their home, uh, many of them had to be evacuated, never able to return to their homes again. Uh, and during the Castle Bravo test, there was a Japanese fishing boat called the Lucky Dragon that was unlucky enough to be in the fallout area. Um, and uh, one of the fishermen died, the others were, ha had radiation poisoning. So this, these are enormously powerful. And so sometimes you don't completely understand what that actually means. So I have a little demonstration. I'm going to um, sort of show what I mean by bigger ones. So each of these fuse beads are, if, let's say we represent one of these uh, as, a, as a sort of Hiroshima-sized nuclear weapon. So one of these little guys. So I'm going to take this jar of fuse beads and see how many, so today we have many nuclear weapons and there are these um, thermonuclear ones, so much more powerful. How many, what do you think the firepower is in the current arsenals of all the countries in the world that have the weapons, the nine countries? Um, you can shout out stop when you think I'm, when I got it. Anyone? So I keep going. Each one of these is a Hiroshima bomb. And I'm... Keep going. Stop. Keep. I need a new jar. I need 170,000. So at the peak of um, the numbers of nuclear weapons in the world, there was about, we'd need about a million. This is gonna be about 170,000. Thank you to the team here, at the, the physics demo team here at University of Michigan for organizing this for me. Yeah, this is a lot, yeah. So. That, uh, when I was talking about the future Oppenheimer feared, he was worried about the, the super. He was worried about uh, nuclear proliferation that other countries would want it. He was worried about what would happen if we didn't have nuclear weapons under international control. And that's, that's, where, that's where we are. Um, so I promise it won't be as, we'll, we'll end on a, not as bad a note as this, but this is, it's pretty incredible once you see it. Um, so to, to refine those designs um, and have different tailored effects, there were many nuclear explosions 
um, done nuclear tests, most of them by the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, you can see this, the dots represent, um, they're not to scale, but they are sizes of the, uh, of these explosions. I think, I, I, I've heard that Nevada is the most bombed place in the world, but most of the time countries shifted these environmental burdens to places that were uh, meant to be remote but colonized, people who were politically dispossessed and couldn't really argue about what was happening um, around them for Kazakhstan, for example, and the Soviet Union and the Marshall Islands for the United States. Um, no countries are testing nuclear weapons today except for North Korea. Um, there's been a moratorium. There's a, a United States stopped, I think, in 1992 um, and Russia at, at about the same time. Uh, India and Pakistan uh, tested theirs in the late 90s. So um, we are, we, that's a piece of good news is that we're not doing this anymore. Um, but again, to sort of orient you, the bomb yields are enormous. So the largest conventional weapons we have today are about 11 tons of TNT. The Hiroshima weapon was about 1,500 times larger. And again, our most powerful weapon ever detonated was 50 megatons. Um, super briefly, just what, what does a nuclear weapon do? So they're meant to be, now that we have them, uh, militaries have plans for using them, and what are they meant to be used for? So the militarily useful attributes are the enormous blast pressure that they can uh, destroy buildings and towns or have or deeply buried military targets. So there's a blast over pressure and there's a wind that comes with that. And so those are important for the military objectives, but they come naturally with other things that are really dangerous for people, including, um, uh, especially if you're close by, uh, nuclear radiation that will kill you immediately. Sometimes that will kill you in the next few weeks, even though you feel okay at first. Um, some of that, depending on how those um, bombs are detonated, sometimes they can suck up large amounts of, um, of soil and contaminate it and distribute it. So then you'll have local fallout or global fallout. Um, so those have wi important widespread humanitarian effects that are not localized to their, their military use. So this is an example um, of a typical, so sort of a typical warhead um, that's in a US or Russian nuclear arsenal, about 455 kilotons. So most of the weapons are not these megaton weapons anymore. They are smaller than that. Um, but uh, so if you orient yourself, you can see Manhattan um, sort of through the center of that, right where it's labeled New York, that's Manhattan. And so if this was sort of centered on there, um, uh, Actually, let's see, um, which the different, so the yellow circle you see is um, where the overpressure is about five pounds per square inch. So a normal unreinforced building would be, would collapse, um, people would be thrown, things would fall on them, and fires would start and become widespread. So um, because of the high temperatures of this thermal radiation, things like paper, trees, uh, gas mains that are broken open, um, gas stations, would catch fire. So there's a lot of fire effects. Um, so enormous numbers, if it's, if it's on a highly populated um, uh, city, you know, millions of people could die um, sort of right away. And the problem is, you would have, also have a lot of injuries. And um, because the area of, of destruction is so large, it's right in the very places where the things you need to recover are located, like your hospitals, your um, your um, power stations, all the emergency responders um, would be uh, as damaged as everything else. So to recover, it would be extremely, um, extremely challenging. Um, and all the, of course, the transportation nodes. Um, again, so if, you know, in the case of all out massive war, where the, the kinds of war that the United States and the Soviet Union were sort of planning, not planning to do, but they had war plans, um, sort of assuming the 2012 arsenals, um, what would happen? Um, in the United States, and it's such an attack, and, and these would normally not necessarily be on population centers, but targeted on industrial centers, which are often co-located with population centers, but not exclusively. Um, such an attack would immediately kill 60 million people, 
and injure another 40 million. We certainly don't have enough hospital beds for the types of burn victims and radiations. There's just, they don't exist anywhere. Um, and in Russia, such an attack would kill a larger percentage because uh, I, I believe their population is more concentrated in cities, which is an important effect. So you expect that many tens of millions more would die later from radiation poisoning and injuries. Um, and lack of shelter, starvation, you'd stop all of your, um, you know, our, our food shipping system is really dependent on, um, you know, having just-in-time deliveries, petroleum reserves, all sorts of things. It can be very, very disruptive. And a longer-term issue, um, in, in, if the conditions happen to be right, where uh, you catch a lot of fires, what can happen is that um, those fires can coalesce into what's called a fire storm. So not just normal fires, what happens is they coalesce into a big fire, so it's big enough that it starts to suck um, air in and swoosh up uh, high enough that it can carry the, con the, the soot from those fires up to the stratosphere where they could potentially be long-lived because there are not that many processes that bring those out fast from the stratosphere. They don't rain out. And that can have climate change effects. So in the 80s, we talked about nuclear winter. If you, if you were around during those years, that might be a familiar concept to you. Um, today, there's active research of colleagues who, who look at these models and do how would it look today? Is this a possibility? And they, their research shows that even in a smaller nuclear exchange, for example, between India and Pakistan, uh, may have the ability to create a firestorm if they're used on population centers that, that are heavily burnable. That would have implications for the rest of the world in you know, leaving potentially hundreds of millions or billions of people at risk of starvation because of the climate disruption. So uh, it would be extremely catastrophic. Um, I've already talked about this, the size of the arsenal, so I won't spend more time, more time on that. Um, but um, there was another innovation at the time that has important implications for us today. So in 1957, um, got to hear the launch of Sputnik. That was the only thing Sputnik really did, was beep. But enormous implications because what launched Sputnik, so Sputnik itself wasn't so such a revolution, didn't do much, but the rocket. So if you could build a rocket that could put something into space, which they did, this is a der derivative of the same research program that the Soviets were using for an ICBM, Intercontinental Ballistic Missile. So if you, can if you have enough rocket power to launch a small thing into orbit, you have enough rocket power to deliver it around the other side of the world. Um, so that, so warfare previous to that had been really localized. You fly your plane to the place that you're gonna do something. Your troops are forward based, but this was now, the idea is you could mount an attack from across the world and not have any forward based troops or anything. So obviously um, clever uh, scientists and engineers you know, thought that the marriage of the two technologies, putting a nuclear weapon on an ICBM would, is, was the future. So that became um, enormously uh, impactful because there was all, then a concern of sort of bolt out of the blue. Um, and then the thing about, um, about these missiles is that they're big, they need to live somewhere, they usually will be put in, often in silos uh, where they're set with their nuclear weapon on them, reinforced, but they're pretty stationary and so there's real concern that they would be vulnerable to an attack, um, especially when you have these powerful hydrogen bombs, which you don't need to um, target so precisely. But the technologies were developed, the, the ability to target using um, missiles, an enormous intellectual effort went into figuring out, you know, gravity model to perfection, you know, uh, the ability to steer your, um, steer and compensate your rocket so that you could basically target, from 10,000 kilometers away, target you know, this block or this part of this block on the other side of the world. So a lot of intellectual effort went into this. Um, so eventually, as, as things happened, bureaucratic interests competed, the Navy wanted a nuclear mission, the Navy got submarines. Um, the Air Force wanted a nuclear m mission, the Air Force had the bombers and the ICBMs. Um, but the implication of these types of, of, of really resting your, um, your nuclear weapons, your deterrence effect. So the idea 
idea eventually coalesced into we can never defend our, I, I hope I, ex, I hope I convinced you that it's, you can't really defend yourself against a nuclear attack. They didn't know what to do with that information, but eventually coalesced on this, um, not even a strategy, but a fact of life that um, you're mutually vulnerable to each other. So what you're going to do is threaten ultimate destruction and the threat of retaliation is enough to make sure you never initiate a nuclear war. And, Mutually assured destruction, yes, uh, which was a fact rather than a strategy or an approach. It just was a, was a fact. So that if you launch a nuclear war, your adversary will make sure that you are destroyed as well. And that that, would, that was meant to deter anybody from starting one. But of course, there's all sorts of anxieties about, well, maybe I think I can catch your nuclear weapons before you launch them at me. I'm going to destroy them on the ground. So that's what led to some of these technologies. So um, these, there was you know, a lot of anxiety about these missiles being put on the ground and maybe my adversary can come and destroy them before I can use them back. And that would disrupt the mutually assured destruction. It would be like unilateral destruction, not mutual. So that drove a strategy to be able to launch these missiles at basically a moment's notice. Um, because a because a missile's traveling from the US to the Soviet Union or the other direction, it takes about 30 minutes. Uh, it goes up into space, basically where the satellites, the lower satellites are living. It comes up and comes back down. It takes about a half an hour. So you have a half an hour between when you recognize that somebody's launched at you to decide, do I launch back? Do I move my missiles up and out of the way? So they created big systems in order to allow the detection of missiles coming at you and to allow a decision to use them right away. So they built these systems for speed. So big radars, space-based infrared satellites that could detect the launch of a missile, radars to see them coming, and a command and control system that was so responsive, it was really built for speed. So from, from the detection, from a Russian launch, so the infrared detection from a, um, from a satellite recognizing there's a launch, it takes about a minute, uh, getting confirmation that that's what you see and typing it, no, it's not a short range missile, no, it's not a space launch vehicle, I think I know what it is, I'm gonna tell the military command. Um, then the president is notified and uh, assembles his or her advisors and has to make a decision about what to do. Um, the president gets debriefed, gets a list of options about what to do, uh, the president decides to launch back or not. Uh, that's still only about, that president has only been deliberating for about 10 minutes. Uh, and if they go ahead and launch, and at about 21 minutes from the launch detection, the launch message for our, uh, our response is received. The missiles are fired and either the Russian bombs detonate or they never, they never were coming in the first place. So that's a lot of time for such a consequential decision. Um, I think we probably all agree that that is a, a system built for speed and not deliberation. Uh, actual decision times could be shorter and missiles can be launched from submarines and so submarines aren't, uh, are traveling the oceans, you know, on constant patrol and they could be significantly closer to their target. So that half an hour could be collapsed, you know, um, in half for a submarine launch. Um, so I'm going to take a minute to talk about some of the implications of that. Uh, so the good news is we all made it through the, <laughs> the Cold War, but there are there are um, reasons. You know, sometimes we might not have um, given given the way we set up these systems. Um, this is an image of. Uh, I, I want to talk about this incident called the training tape inc incident. Um, this was in 1979, and so that day the unthinkable happened. The computers at the North American Aerospace Defense Headquarters, NORAD, if you, if you know that, um, it showed a large-scale Soviet missile attack underway. So just this thing, detecting the launches, seeing them coming, but lots of missiles. Um, the launches came from Soviet silos and submarines off the west coast and they looked exactly like the kind of massive attack the United States dreaded. Yeah, and um, So the US nuclear bomber crews readied themselves to take off. 
um, and fighter interceptors took off. Um, but when the communication with the U.S. early warning stations, those radars didn't show anything coming. They didn't show any confirmation of what was they were seeing on the, on the screens. Um, it was deemed a false alarm, and Pentagon officials were mystified. They didn't know why this happened. Later, investigators discovered that a technician was running a training tape on a computer that had a training exercise simulating full-scale attack. Um, inexplicably, this showed on the, NOR, on the regular NORAD screens. Um, as far as I, you know, a lot of the details are classified, but as far as we know, they weren't able to reproduce this error mode, weren't able to explain it, but it, it never happened again. So crisis averted, no one, no one, no one lost any, um, no one launched anything. In 1983, there's a, wonderful, there's a wonderful film called The Man Who Saved the World, and this is uh, Colonel Stanislav Petrov. He was a Soviet um, officer who was on duty one day, and uh, the Soviets had just created their own sort of early warning system, and he saw a similar thing on the screen, although it was just a couple of missiles coming, and he, by protocol, was supposed to notify his his upper, you know, his superiors, but he didn't think it looked like the kind of beginning of a nuclear war would look like. It seemed weird to him. So he held off a little bit and didn't report it up the chain. And eventually um, they realized that um, the satellites mistook sunlight reflecting off the tops of clouds for missile launches. And the orbit used by the Soviet satellites was designed to minimize the chances of that, but that with the, but the sort of the alignment of the autumn equinox, the satellites and the sun and the US missile fields all sort of aligned in a way that this mistake could have been made. So of course, when you, understand, when you find the mistake, you fix that failure mode, but there have been dozens of close calls and I'm sure plenty more that, that have not made it into the public domain. So we have been running risks. Uh, I guess is the is the main point here. So um, I'm going to skip history up until today um, to kind of orient you why I'm still so concerned, why it is not a cold, even though I'm using a lot of historical archival images, this is, to, this is a today problem. This is not a cold war. We're all finished with it. Um, of course, you can't have escaped notice uh, uh, that in the Ukraine war, there has been increasing sort of saber rattling by Russian um, officials around um, using nuclear weapons in that conflict. There are more nuclear weapon states than there were. There are nine, um, so that makes for a more complex system than this sort of U.S.-Soviet uh, main dynamic. Um, again, as I mentioned, we still need to keep nuclear material out of the hands of people uh, who might use it. Um, there are new technologies such as cyber weapons, artificial intelligence, and anti-satellite weapons, all sorts of new things that start to um, intersect with these complicated systems of warning, command, and control for these systems that make um, predictability more challenging. And um, there is an incipient arms race that we're in. The US, Russia, and China are all investing in rebuilding and improving their nuclear arsenals. The US plans to spend a trillion dollars to replace the bombers the um, ICBMs and the subs. Um, and uh, Russia is building, has recapitalized its own system, is building novel new weapon systems to get around US defenses. And China is also uh, modernizing and expanding its nuclear weapons. And the US does not have good relationships with either Russia or China with which to diffuse these things. And the, the approach that we'd used before arms control, which is how we went from having a million of those beads down to 170,000 of those beads, those treaties are starting to collapse. The United States has withdrawn from them. Um, Russia is withdrawing from them. Um, and the last nuclear uh, treaty standing, the new uh, START treaty, um, will um, expire in 2026. Uh, and Russia has already suspended its compliance with that treaty. So we are entering an era where we don't have the guardrails that we used to. It's much more complex, and there are a lot of nuclear threats that, that are in the air. Um, but in the past, so that's the bad news. So I do want to say, how did, we, how did we meet these challenges in the past? How did we deal with them? Because we did, in many ways. Um, as I mentioned, arms control. Um, the United States and Sov Soviets got really good at negotiating with each other. This is a picture of a bilateral consultative commission, which is the group of technical people that meets um, in the New START Treaty to talk about, I, I see you doing this, I'm not, I, I, I want you to explain what you're doing, da-da-da-da-da. Um, 
these are ways that not only do we constrain the numbers of nuclear weapons, because this treaty constrains um, the deployed nuclear weapons to around 1,550 for each of the two countries, but it allows a, a way to discuss nuclear risks with each other. And it did an, an amazing job. Um, so if you look at this graph from the 50s to about today, these are the total number of nuclear warheads. So it isn't sized for capacity, it isn't say how, how, how explosive they are, but this is pure numbers. And um, you can see we peaked at about 60,000 um, you know, in the 80s, but we've really done a, a tremendous job at reducing those arsenals. We're down to about 10% you know, of what that, what that was. And so these treaties are really important. You can see as you do them, you, we're walking ourselves back from the brink. So those are really important techniques. I also wanted to point out that scientists, because we are here in a, a science in the morning talk, scientists have had a really unique uh, role in this, not just the type of Szilard uh, troublemaking, uh, and he continued to work on these problems too, but um, you know, they partner, partnering with communities around their concerns. So on the left, that's Linus Pauling, who got a new, uh, Nobel Peace Prize for his work um, organizing scientists to move nuclear tests, to advise for moving nuclear tests from being in the atmosphere to underground. Um, um, I don't, like in the 50s, some of you might have um, been around at that time, uh, there was a big effort by communities to collect baby teeth um, in St. Louis to test them for strontium-90, evidence of fallout. So while these te the above-ground nuclear tests were happening, people didn't necessarily know that fallout was was landing in their communities. So community groups collected teeth to get some data, and scientists jumped, jumped into this too, and Linus Pauling organized this, one of the people who organized this effort to, um, to provide the technical rationales for the partial test ban treaty, which moved nuclear tests underground. Um, so tests underground continued, but there was, of course, an effort to stop nuclear testing at all to stop this process of developing new and more, um, you know, refined, interesting designs to just stop nuclear tests. So on the right, this is uh, Tom Cochran, who was a physicist working for the National Resources Defense Council, and Evgeny Velikov, who was the the chair of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and they wanted to convince their governments that it would be possible to verify a total ban on nuclear tests. So to support something called the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which would stop um, nuclear weapons tests at all. And they got a bunch of seismologists and other types of, of scientists to carry equipment over. Um, and the Soviets hosted like a demo experiment, sort of a, like a, not a hackathon, but sort of like a hackathon there to kind of show that this was a possi possible thing to do. And they both worked their own governments to lobby for uh, signing on to a Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And we're successful in getting that moving forward. And the public had a big role in this too, and I want to make sure that we acknowledge that. Um, this is Coretta Scott King, who was really committed to nuclear abolition from her earliest days as an undergraduate. And she uh, was very influential on her husband, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., to include this in, as an important core piece of civil rights, believing that no, you know, civil rights may not be important if we're not alive. And, uh, was very concerned about the amount of money that was being redirected into military spending when it could be better used for human development. So that was a core piece of, of that um, organizing in the 60s, 50s and 60s. This is um, June 1982, uh, Central Park, New York. And um, Randall Forsberg famously galvanized a grassroots movement in the U.S. called the Nuclear Freeze Mo Movement, which was a simple call for a bilateral halt between the U.S. and the Soviet Union on all nuclear weapons production. Um, uh, and um, a million people showed up. There was a big concert, which sounded like a, I would have loved to go to that. Great people there, um, unusual, and um, was influential in, in putting public pressure on Ronald Reagan at the time. And then I'm going to sh shift to today. On the left, um, in the pink lay, that's my colleague um, Lily Adams, who works as part of my team. And those are some of the Pacific Islanders who uh, share this heritage, this legacy effect of the nuclear testing, and have been trying to get recognition and remediation and compensation for their harms. And on the right, um, this is the effort of other co countries, 
um, in the rest of the world, who are, most of them were not nuclear weapons countries who organized this, but to negotiate, to, to uplift the idea, the effects of, the humanitarian effects of nuclear weapons to make sure people understood that, that research was being done to better understand it, and that those implications were uh, impactful in policy making. So um, over an effort of several, of a number of years, they um, got political support, organized um, treaty negotiations in the United Nations system to negotiate a treaty called the Treaty on to, um, TPNW, Treaty uh, on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which prohibits the production, uh, use, testing, hosting of nuclear weapons. Um, and it was went into force and ratified, and the team behind it won the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts. And catching up with you today, um, as it turns out, you know, even though most people aren't, aren't always thinking about nuclear weapons, when asked, when asked, on average, people in the United States, nuclear weapons are not popular across the aisle. This is not a Democrat-Republican thing. This is, uh, is, this is a widely held sentiment in, in the American people that no countries should be allowed to have nuclear weapons. Um, it's really interesting results and something that indicates you know, some, some ways to make uh, progress. Um, and so I think I wanted to land back on, um, this is a picture of Szilard and Einstein. Um, I, I just wanted to point to some of these interesting techniques that they've tried and sort of invented different ways to get at this problem, writing petitions, asking your famous friends to help, organizing scientists. Um, Wherever you, wherever you are, whatever your particular place in society is, there's a role for you, a thing for you to do. Um, so I'd like to challenge you to think about what, even in a small part, part of your day, you, you might have to offer here. Um, and I'm gonna land on, oops. I'm gonna land on this, which is a picture I took last fall. This is in Hiroshima. Um, these are students. And this is the Children's Memorial at Hiroshima. And they have a real uh, community education effort to make sure that, that the victims of the nuclear, nuclear bombings were not forgotten and that we encourage people to commit to peace. So they came to pay their respects at the Children's Memorial. They had songs and poems that they prepared and were really just wonderful and hopeful. Um, so I'm going to leave it on this, and I'd be happy to talk to you about ideas for solutions or to take questions on the technology or the history, and thanks again for coming. Thank you so much, Laura, um, for that assessment and telling us where we are, where we could go. Um, we'll have the question and answer. We're getting that set up. We'll have microphones here in the room. If you'd like to ask a question, they're in both aisles. And we've gotten a few online, so we'll start in just a moment. Um, okay, let's start here. I have two questions. I don't know which should go first. Um, my one is, since we're not next to banning all nuclear power, um, can, as you were pointing out, U.S. and Russia are both in a new process of updating, upgrading yeah. their stockpiles and their silos. Can the can the fuel that's in the old ones be reused in the new ones, or do we have to keep re mm -hmm. refining more uh -huh. uranium? My other question is where you almost got, is there any way to circle back to the idea of international control? Thank you, those are both great questions. So, um, in fact, you are, the first question, which I'll rephrase for people, where we are redoing our nuclear, um, in the United States and lots of other countries, we are refurbishing, uh, modernizing, um, 
existing nuclear weapons. The question was, can we use the old nuclear materials or do we have to produce new nuclear materials? So that's, a, um, that's an active research question, actually. Um, one of my colleagues in my program is doing a t big technical report on it, called, looking at what's called plutonium pit production. So um, plutonium is a new material. Uh, it hasn't even been around for 100 years, so you, know, you don't know everything about it. But, uh, but we think it is, um, you know, from this, the, we have big labs, scientific labs in the United States that study questions like this. So there's active research trying to understand the material properties of plutonium and how it ages. So it's an active scientific question that um, a number of bodies have weighed in on and, and have assessed that they probably last in excess of 100 years, 120 years. But we're looking carefully at what they're saying and, and into the details. But um, we have plenty of plutonium. Um, so, you know, that's not necessary, uh, especially since we've reduced so much. The, the problem is more, what do you do with all of the stuff that you've made? So there are different, there are different ways into uh, different, different techniques that you can do to, um, you know, make those not usable by somebody who might happen upon them. And then the second question was, uh, are we close to, uh, oh, international control. I don't think we are. Um, you know, is there a path? Is there a path? So, um, uh, the way nuclear weapons used now are so firmly lodged in in in, in each country's individual security. Uh, I would like to see. I, I I absolutely think it's essential that our future goes there. And getting from here to there is really challenging. So, um, um, but, uh, and we do need a strong United Nations, which isn't particularly strong right now. We do need people working hard on treaties. So I think that's where eventually, when we get to low numbers, that's where we have to be. But so we're trying to methodically look at different paths there, but it's tricky. Yeah. Um, you actually um, have several questions online, so I wanted to insert one now. Okay. Um, which is to talk about, well, the question was specifically about the Star Wars program uh -huh. and the feasibility of it, but maybe you could just talk more generally about um, missile defense countermeasures and missile defense, yeah. So uh, there's a program in the 80s um, that uh, President Ronald Reagan initiated. Um, so he was as horrified as I hope you were today by our vulnerability to nuclear weapons and thought that was an untenable way to live your life under such threat, which I agree, and, and did not like that the only way we're trying to be safe is by threatening destruction of somebody else, that that didn't seem like a great strategy. So he thought, I, you know, United States has enormous technical and economic resources. We must be able to escape this vulnerability, and we must be able to stop those missiles before they come. And so initiated a project called Strategic Defense Initiative, but people nicknamed it Star Wars pretty quickly because of the impracticality of this question. As it turns out, it's extremely hard. Uh, and they had sort of invented all sorts of um, technologies, or they had aspired to technologies that were not either, either impractical or not going to work at all um, um, to try to escape this vulnerability. Um, but it was impactful politically because it was something that um, sort of disrupted this agreement between mutual assured destruction. And so, uh, it, in fact, it played a spoiler role when Gorbachev and Reagan met and they had almost agreed to abolish nuclear weapons. And, um, but it was sort of contingent on the United States giving up this approach to SDI. That I, I think this is how this, I, I'm not a historian, so there's details I might not have quite right. And, we didn't want to, and so we've quickly abandoned um, that, that approach. I, I'm not sure their advisors would have loved that they agreed to get rid of nuclear weapons, but they were open to the idea. So then those plans came back to the ground and tried to have you know, sort of smaller, different approaches to try to knock down these missiles as they're coming towards you. And then we still have programs today that are meant to try to destroy nuclear, um, so nuclear weapons are in this, are in like a reentry vehicle packaged in a big hard casing as they fly through space as a way to destroy those as they're coming. Um, but really it's only, um, you know, uh, it's even challenging to do against a state like North Korea that has very few resources. Um, it's just a very hard problem. So it's um, never should really be considered as a way to escape this essential vulnerability.
Thanks. Um, so we often talk about the civilization ending risk by the nuclear bomb. Mm -hmm. And people believe that human beings can be terminated because of the nuclear bomb. But I also have thought that it will be really the hatred and then cruelty of human beings to kill each other, uh, indeed, which will eventually lead to destroy the human being. So the nuclear bomb could be one of the tools, but like uh, it wouldn't really matter which would be the definite tool if there's a huge party, who huge, huge party of people who's willing to kill each other, they will try to kill other people by all means. Mm. So I was like, trying to ask in this regard, mm. in your opinion, can we be still confident enough to say the nuclear bomb is the, the, the strongest and greatest weapon at all times on Earth? Like 80 years ago in 1985 and 45, it was obviously no doubt that nuclear we weapon was absolutely the strongest weapon on Earth. And, and I also have believed that that way whole time, but going through the COVID, I, my thoughts shifted a little bit and, you know, I'm really curious that, you know, like human beings have not been able to come up with any better or stronger technology compared to nuclear yet. Because I was also thinking about if that you showed the map when the nuclear bomb was detonated. And then I also imagined the, what if that COVID was detonated that way? It's going to kill people in, you know, a couple of days. And so, um, I, I'm, you know, like, is the nuclear, nuclear still be the only matter that we have to discuss as a special issue? Or is it really the, can we just talk? I mean, is there will be, I, you know, nuclear, in my opinion, nuclear may not be the only matter that we have to discuss about this, you know, the well-being of the human being. We also need to talk about all the tech, technologies that can be potentially in, put human beings in danger. And then most of all, I think it's important to people, I mean, you know, tell people instead of intimidating people by talking about, about the impact of the nuclear bomb, I think it's, you know, more important to tell people, let's not, you know, let's not hate each other. And then we need to get harmonized it, and then don't get to the point that we want to kill each other. I think that part, I thought that part might be more, I mean, more important compared to, you know, talking about the impact of the nuclear bomb, I thought. So that, that was like long, but that was my question, actually. Do you still believe that nuclear weapon is the strongest <laughs> thing I, at all? Th thanks. Uh, thank you. Actually, I, you're not going to get an argument from me about what you said. I think um, there's no way to... I, I don't think we ever get to the end where we need to be with just a technological fix, right? You do have to find a way to exist better with each other and not um, um, and minimize the reasons countries go to war and, and have a more global sense of security rather than national security. I think that that's definitely got to be part of the solution. And I've certainly been to these, um, had talks and experiences where I think what I'm doing uh, is not nearly as important as artists and humanitarians who are working on those very things you said, trying to make sure that we lessen our impulses to destroy each other. So the reason, though, that I think that I, that I spend my career on doing this is that nuclear weapons are just an order of order of scale, just so much bigger and more and worse. You can, you know. Um, Yes, for example, a hammer can be a tool and it can kill somebody. But you have to do, you know, but a gun is designed to kill and kill quickly. So there's an order of magnitude difference between nuclear weapons and regular weapons. Um, you know, those, the, you don't have to send hundreds of airplanes. In one bomb, you can destroy a city. So your worst impulses are married with something that has immediate, irreversible, destructive intent, which is really, I think, why I... I I work at that nexus. There are lots of threats, I think, that we need to be paying attention to, and there are probably weapons. I don't, I, I don't know enough about the, how to assess the, the way people talk about generalized AI, whether that truly has the types of threats that people ascribe to them. But 
the worst weapon I know about is nuclear weapons, and we know they exist, and we know what they do. So, but th thanks for those comments. I, I take them to heart. Let me inject a technical, kind of technical question, um, or maybe two. One of them is the mushroom cloud. Whether that was actually anticipated, do you know, uh, before the Trinity test? That's a good question. I don't know if they've done those um, calculations. That's not something that I know. Um, and just just to catch a mushroom cloud is really the I, iconic thing that when you see it, that's what you think a nuclear weapon is about. And I almost never use that image because it really privileges the people who are doing the bombing and not the people who are on the other side of it. So um, I know I try not to use that image a lot. But what hap you know what happens is it's a huge amount of um, hot material goes up, and as it cools, it whoosh, down. Um, and I think. That is married with this idea of fallout, um, and I think maybe that's what your 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 question was. Did they really were they really prepared for the extent of the fallout that would have come from Trinity? I don't know how well they were prepared for that. They, you know, I think they waited on the weather um, uh, to try to, you know, increase success. I think they did make allowances to try to make it make sure that if they're if they're. Uh, intuition about what would happen was correct, that there was some, that it wouldn't harm that many people, but I, I don't know what they knew about it. They did detonate uh, bombs over Japan at tens of thousands of feet, and yeah. the Trinity test was at a few hundred feet. Yeah. So there was some calculations That's that right. must have been done in terms of the effectiveness based on that. I have two questions. One is, um, it seems that we've gone along a long time with mutual destruction being able to uh, prevent war. Uh, but third parties who might not have uh, much interest in it other than destroying the rest of the world, um, uh, what are those threats right now? And the other is, what is the, uh, how close are we to using fusion to generate power? Electrical power. That, that's okay. the climate change issue, I know. Yeah. Okay, so there's a, a lot of questions there. So wait, the first one was... Um, third parties. Third... But what, there's one before that. No? No, no, that, uh, uh, that was the first one. That, 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 that I feel that third parties are, are more likely to cause... Yeah, okay, so what are we, what are we doing about... Massive destruction of the Earth. Okay, oh, I, no, but in fact, there's something I, I didn't want to let slide, because you said it, we have because a lot of people will ascribe the relative lack of conventional conflict to mutual shirt destruction. And I, I don't want to be so quick to give it all the credit or much of the credit. I think the jury is out on that. It's a matter of a lot of debate. Um, because we also had better economic and cultural integration of countries. We were sick of war um, and really wanted to build international systems of cooperation. So I think we have to allow that those also had a lot to do with not having war during this, the mutual assured destruction. Okay, so third parties, so like way back at the beginning of the talk, I hope the point I was trying to take away is the bottleneck here is getting your hands on fissile materials. So a third party is very unlikely to be able to successfully build, um, you know, a, a really well working cascade of centrifuges unless it has the support, economic and logistical support um, that's a, a pretty sophisticated organization, so not a sort of run everyday one. Or, you know, the ability to um, create plutonium in a reactor and extract it. But, so the real thing you gotta do is get all of those under lock and key as much as possible. And um, so after the, after the Soviet Union collapsed, the US had a huge effort to go to Soviet Russia and employ make sure all those Soviet scientists were gainfully employed, that we all had a shared idea of what keeping things under lock and key were. And in the Obama administration, there was a big effort also to really go out into the world and identify where these materials, where do they need to be, can we pull them under better security, and to try to really get a handle on that. Because once those, once you have your hands on that, I mean, it's a very hard problem. It's a much easier problem if you can make sure nobody gets those materials. And so that's where the effort really goes. I don't have a, any inside assessment about where we are on that, but I think we're doing pretty well. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.
That actually um, specifically addressed another of the online questions. Okay, whether good. It, a state sponsor would be required for a terrorist to acquire a bomb. Um, or build. More or less, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, depending. I'm kind of, yeah. yeah. How are we here? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists I've always thought has been primarily uh, known for its contributions to making people aware of the risks of, of nuclear uh, destruction. Uh, I think that a lot could be done by starting to elevate making people aware of the possibilities of improving life mm -hmm. on Earth. Mm. I think UCA could do a lot of that. I think in the current political competition, we could be, some people could be talking about how the how much Russia and China would be better off if they were trying to make the world a better place for everyone, mm. including themselves, mm. rather than trying to expand their, their control over small area and and admitting that the US does a lot of bad things but that if we started working more together we could do a lot of things I've always struggled with how do you actually think about putting um, some sort of international control over nuclear power without having those people then controlling everybody um, but I think that um, you could work on that. Uh, you could start by modeling how to how to wipe out an aggressor with a small amount of nuclears without causing the uh, storm clouds, perhaps. But uh, anyway, if you have any thoughts on Thanks. that or could start implementing it, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thank you for the suggestion. We always try to be solutions oriented. Uh, I, I skipped that slide here, but I have a number of things we're trying to do to address this particular problem rather than like transforming society at large, although we do have efforts, especially to work with other scientists, like-minded scientists, to have those similar things happen elsewhere, right? Not just a U.S. problem, but, but the point taken, thank you. Yeah. I, I did want to mention that the movie A Compassionate Spy does give I a very that, different yeah. view of the, the, of the release of the atomic information to the Soviet Union yeah. and, and a different view of a lot of the different issues. I thought Oppenheimer, the movie, biased things a lot toward kind of saying that it was kind of yeah. natural that the U.S. had to go the way it did and, and uh, yeah, that gives a very different view. Mm. So I encourage you. I think it was Netflix or one of the other ones that still has it. Yeah. So A Compassionate Spy is a film about one of the young scientists, was a very young scientist, who during his, um, he, he took a trip home for his birthday. He walked into a um, Soviet consulate and offered to explain what the U.S. was doing in the hopes that we would uh, have a shared sense of responsibility for the technology and the U.S. wouldn't use it to be hegemonic, I think, essentially. So it was a good movie. I appreciated it, too. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, um, as bad as nuclear technology is, has been, or could be, uh, we have another technology now that was recently accidentally or uh, naturally demonstrated in, in 2019 with COVID, the mm. possibility of, of biological warfare. And I, I think it might be able to be better controlled, but if, if we're not doing it now, not controlling it now, it's going to get worse. Yep. We tolerate a lot. Question from online. Um, is a false alarm, you told us two mm -hmm. uh, incidents. Yes. Is a false alarm more likely to start a nuclear war than aggression? Well, so, um, you know, I, I, I don't have a quantitative way to assess risk like of that. So I, I wouldn't assign numbers to that. But I certainly think countries, the people in charge of such things, are acutely aware of most of what I've shown you today, that they would be enormously destructive and the consequences of intentionally starting a war. Um, but I, so I, nor, I do think that mistakes, miscalculations, misinterpretations, um, and false alarms, it doesn't even necessarily need to be a false alarm, it might be not understanding the signals that your adversary 
is trying to send you. Um, they might be trying to send you a, a, a back off signal and you read their signal as we're about to attack you so you should attack us. So there's lots of room for those types of mistakes in a system that you've primed for rapid decision making. That's the, really the piece that concerns me the most is the requirement that you make decisions often or not the requirement but it's set up for you to do so. Um, so I am very concerned about uh, mistakes, miscalculations, and uh, false alarms. Uh, I kind of have two questions, I guess. I know we're low on time, so maybe you can take your pick. But one of them was just I was curious to hear more about, like, I know that one of the goals is reducing the number of nuclear weapons, and I was wondering what happens to those that we've already built, if you could maybe talk about that more in detail. And then I was also wondering a little bit about in terms of modern applications, I remember hearing on the news stuff about like uh, Russia considering using like tactical nukes in Ukraine and like mm -hmm. smaller weapons mm -hmm. that aren't necessarily as massively destructive and like, you know, so far that's kind of taboo, but like, is that a possible future that we would have to worry about? Um, sorry, the first question again? Yeah, what happens to the nukes? Yeah, okay, yeah. so um, we know how to disassemble them because we have disassembled thousands. Uh, so, you, you know, you can take apart the, the missiles and, and whatnot, and uh, the, the pits, the, the inner, the, the, the piece that's really the thing that you're worried about, the fissile materials. In the United States, I believe the disposition of those are all done at a plant in Texas called Pantex. Uh, but I'm not an expert in how they, uh, the storage and the, ultimate way you dispose of them in a way that can't be retrieved later. I think that's an active technology question. And then you asked about Russian um, tactical nuclear weapons. And so I'm gonna show you what, tactical nuclear weapons aren't one of these. Tactical nuclear weapons are like, you know, 10 of these, right? So that's how you should think about them. They're not tiny little weapons that do a little bit of a thing. They're almost always more powerful um, than the Hiroshima and Nagasaki weapons. Um, so it's a real concern because there is um, some suggestion that Russia might be thinking or somebody might think that by using a smaller nuclear weapon, they can say, we are ready to escalate this to a war, a general nuclear war that you don't want, so we want you to back off. And that that would be a signal. And this is what I'm talking about, misinterpretation. Does, does is that signal interpreted correctly, I think nobody knows what happens on the other side of any kind of nuclear use. And the risks of things getting out of control, I think, are way too high to contemplate being cavalier about using them in some way to spur some other kind of reaction by your adversary or to, to warn them off. And they're not generally sort of battlefield useful. They don't, it's not the way you destroy a bunch of tanks. It's not, it's not a useful weapon for those types of situations. Anyway, they're really a political weapon. Yeah. Thanks. I think to be quantitative, um, a conventional bomb that can destroy a building or tanks is uh, maybe at most 10 tons. And these weapons, are, even tactical weapons, are 10 kilotons, a thousand times even more, more, is that right? Uh, more than that. More yeah, than that. yeah. A lot of buildings. <laughs> Question here? Yeah. Okay. So um, you've said that the, the fissile material, um, luckily, <laughs> uh, is hard to come by, and so uh, terrorist organizations um, would not be able to easily get their hands on this. But earlier in your talk, you talked about uh, uranium-235 versus 238, and that, um, and, sorry, I'm, I'm so, uh, the 235 is the one that we use for making this, but the 238, most of it is, uh, is what uranium is, is easily found in that form. What is the likelihood of that uh, ever being able to be used and therefore being so much more available in a quantity? And I'm sorry if that's an easy physics question, oh. but I have no idea why um, 235 versus 238 is, um, you know, uh, the preferred one for, for yep. a nuclear weapons versus, you know, totally useless, thankfully. Yeah. Yeah. So no, thank that, you. That's, that's a great question. question. So your, your question is, um, is, well, I explained, 
hopefully, but I, this went by really fast, that uranium-235 is the right isotope for these reactions, and uranium-238 uh, is not, which is great because there is a lot of uranium-238 around the world, and if people were dropping rocks on other rocks, we would probably have nuclear, <laughs> you know, if they were critical in, those, in, in these huge tons, we would have nuclear explosions all the time. So it, it doesn't work. The physics doesn't work. Um, and the work that it takes to um, get the 235, when you hear the word enriched uranium, low enriched uranium, high enriched uranium, that's the percentage of the isotope uranium-235 compared to 238. And so that's an intensive, as I said, either mechanical process or chemical process or some way to, to concentrate that, and that's a hard problem. So we're not going to... Um, the physics won't work that you can use uranium-238 for a bomb, you know, but, you know, varying levels of enrichment for the material, you know, you can do different bomb designs. It doesn't have to be the best bomb in the world, you know, but, um, but you really do need to, like, a minimum effort is not enough to, to get the material into something you'd use for a bomb. It really is a, um, it, it really is a technical bottleneck that, that um, is, a, you know, I don't envision a way really around it. Yeah. Well, with that, thanks so much for coming back to Ann Arbor, for bringing your expertise. Thank you, Look Thank forward you, to seeing you all next time.